I appreciate the very nice introduction. Um, also glad that David is much more in the heart and public than I am, so I'm going to probably take care of more of the head. Uh, as many of you probably already expect. Um, I'll save my heart for my wedding. Um, so, usually, um, when I come to a bris, as religious as I am, or as some of you know us to be, there's something very difficult when you're confronted by the crying baby, blood, the screaming, here we are, all nice dressed up people, and here's this baby. There's something that seems like almost barbaric, and maybe some people harbor in those inner, inner, inner sense, like, is this really, okay, you know. Maybe for the religious person, God said so, that might be enough. But even for the religious person, they're not, you know, always in such a plane of, you know, God said so, it's enough. So especially nowadays, how the British is very much under attack, barbaric, you know, again, this is not just me saying this, like a lot of movements claiming this is barbaric, and so I wanted to maybe share, and maybe really, maybe uh, I want to think about and delve into the meaning of the bris. So I want to share some, some ideas with you that hopefully will help emphasize how we kind of need the bris now more than ever. Um, and I think, as a side note, uh, usually I experience the bris in that kind of almost traumatic way. But today, when I actually saw it happening in front of me, over there. Over there. I actually experienced it not as being so traumatic. It was just like, oh, I almost like, the, like it was a very, I want to say pleasant, because you can't, there's a sympathy for the baby, but it was much less, less grueling. And I, I know, given all the learning I did this morning, researching the topic, I, I can't know whether it's the learning or whether it's just being up close. You know, my theory is that if it's, if, it's, if it's just being up close, so when you're far away, you see the blood, you see the screaming, your, your imagination wanders. Oh my God, it's probably like torture, they're probably like, you know, doing all sorts of stuff. And then when you see it, it's like, oh, okay, it's like you see exactly what's going on, it's maybe, maybe that's it. But I, I think also that maybe it's the learning and understanding that I gained of it, gave it more, uh, you know, uh, permeated my experience. Um, so, usually I just speak from the cuff. I just want to make sure I, I, I present things in an organized way because I, I tend to ramble and <laughs> run all over the place. So, basically, so we pointed out just now how the bris, from a, a non-religious perspective, is bizarre and weird. However, also from a religious perspective, the bris is not so, there, there are many questions about the bris. Um, first of all, why is it called the bris? What other mitzvah gets a name that's so, like, nondescript, right? Tefillin are called tefillin. Right? They could have been called the bris. You know, this, this, the mitzvah could have been called the cutting, right? But it's called the covenant, right? Why is the bris chosen as, as this covenant? Second of all, you can do it on Shabbat. A lot of mitzvahs, you know, you know, you know, Shabbat's really primary. Oh, to save a life, you break Shabbat. The bris is saving a life. Okay, do it on Sunday. What's the big deal? Why are you rushing right away? And so, in last week's parsha, Moshe he delayed in, in circumcising his child, and there's a story of someone tries to come to kill him because he waited even just a few moments. So there's this exigency, but doing get doing a bris right away. Why? What's so special about that? Also, only men get circumcised. What's up with that, right? Why not women? Not, not in terms of equality, but if it's meant to, from a religious perspective, if it's meant to embody a reminder of, of the bris, of coming to God, well, women, they don't have that, they don't walk around with that. What, you know, that's another question. Also, in terms of centrality, there's a story some of you may know that it says Avram Avinu stands at the gates of Gehenna, the gates of hell, and anyone who's about to go into Gehenna, if they have a bris, he, he keeps them from going in there. So like so, somehow but having a bris keeps a person from purgatory. There's some qualifications I'm going to get to. It's not just anyone with a bris, but um, again, the, the, the emphasis is that it's something that is very, that is very central. All right, so I think there's three important elements I'm going to try to repeat, and this is what I want people to leave with, I guess is that the bris symbolizes identity, morality, and then ultimately relationships. I'm going to fill in each of those. On the identity level, the bris, on its most basic form, is, is physical. It's, it's a physical, permanent mark on the body, right? So much so that some of the commentators say, why aren't you allowed to get tattoos? What's wrong with a tattoo? Get a barbie, get a flower, what's the big deal? So some say because the tattoo is another permanent mark on the body that, fun, that, that can... Um, very much affect a person's sense of identity. A lot of people get tattoos, it's like, I'm this, I'm that. So it's like, no, you have a bris. There already is something about imbuing an identity in a very permanent way into the child, right? In terms of women, some, there's a debate whether a woman can be a moel or not. Some say no, because they say someone can only be a moel if they're able to be circumcised. Some say yes, because it says mahol, yahul, which is that a person that is circumcised can circumcise. And by the, was a moel. What? Sephora was a moel. Right, so, so they said, so that opinion says that, um, that a woman is allowed to circumcise because she's considered already circumcised, which you can think about I'm later. I'm not going to get too caught up on that, right? Um, so, so that's that's the physical basic level, right? And then on the on the moral level, the Torah often speaks of Hashem says, "And you shall circumcise your hearts, right? You remove the foreskin of your heart." Where does that metaphor come from, right? In that sense, it's referring to the evil inclination. So there's a, there's a connection already between 
foreskin and evil inclination, with desire, that? morality, right? By, there's an idea that by removing this foreskin, the physical, not only are we imprinting a, a deep sense of identity, but we're also removing an extra sense for desire, for, for impermissible inclination. So there's also this moral layer to it as well. And from that, to give a moral thing about the women question, we're kind of keeping on the side here, the Barbino mentions that it's not about carrying the bris that matters, it's about coming out of one. That Yitzchak, it's, you know, taking that limb and sanctifying it to God, and then everyone comes out of that. So that, that's, a re- that's a very also valuable point. That everyone should come from a place of holiness and intention. Um, and finally, and this is a very important one, is, is, is the sense of relationship. Um, the, the rabbis teach us, there's, there's a verse, and they understand a certain verse to mean, the world was created for the sake of the bris. Right? Like, ooh, like what, like, that's a very broad statement, right? So the way I understand is that the bris, the world's created for the sake of bris, the world's created for the sake of what the bris stands for which I think is connection between us and Hashem, and then us and each other. Because just as much as the bris binds us to God, it also binds us to each other as a people. And this is, and I think this is where Chazal, the sages, are telling us we should spend our energy. And these are all embedded in the bris. Um, maybe this is inspired by Victoria a little bit, because I tend to be very kind of intellectual, point by point. So I was, in, during the prayer serve this morning, I, just, I read a certain portion that really, I think, captures some of these ideas. So it's a little more poetic. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to just read this for you. We say it every morning. And I think it, it, it follows this. It follows the sense of first comes identity, and then, and then comes uh, morality, and then comes relationship. Because only once you know who you are, then you know what you have to do, and then you can start building things with people. So it says like this. Master of all worlds, <clears throat> not in the merit of our righteousness do we cast our supplications before you, but in the merit of your abundant mercy. Now, before we the next part, this is a key point. Like, the world confronts us without identity. With, with a, there's a big existential problem. There's a challenge of existence. What should I do? Where should I go? How should I be? Right? With all our education today, you know, we see we can't take our own culture seriously because we feel like oh, we're just another strange group of people with our strange practices. Because we're smart enough to know that we're not the only one with the tradition or whatever it is. So this is, I think, a fundamental challenge for the modern person. Right? Because we have all these things we can't take ourselves seriously. So here's what it says, and this is I think going to capture that. What are we? What is our life? What is our kindness? What is our righteousness? What is our salvation? What is our strength? What is our might? What can we say before you, Hashem our God and the God of our forefathers? Are not all the mighty men like nothing before you? The men of renown as if they had never been? The wise as if without knowledge? And those of understanding as if devoid of intelligence? For most of their deeds are nothing, and the days of their lives are empty before you. The preeminence of man over beast is non-existence, for all is futile. My dad very often will... <laughs> not the land reminding me of this, how this is life. What's the point? You take out Earth. You just say, well, we're not here anymore. Now what? Right? Like we, we seem so insignificant. So how do we respond? How are we supposed to live meaningful, happy, motivated lives in the face of this nothingness and meaninglessness? So I think the next the next words I think emphasize this, and they remind us of identity. So what's the response? It says, "But we are your people, members of your covenant, which is the Bris, children of Abraham, your beloved, whom you took an oath in Mount Moriah." So number one, we confront this. This challenge of existence with identity. Who am I? I am someone. Whatever you want to fill it in. To have a strong sense of identity. And, the, and then, once you have that established, now I know who I am, what should I do? And then it continues. Therefore, we are obliged to thank you, praise you, glorify you, sanctify, and offer praise and thanks to your name. Once we know who we are and where we stand in the list of things, now we know what we have to do. And this also implies between people. I'm a father, I'm a brother, I'm a friend. Now I know who I am, now I know what to do. And then lastly, if you do these three things, you can engage in relationships which I think, and this is how the prayer concludes, we are fortunate for how good is our portion, how pleasant our lot, and how beautiful our heritage. And when we engage these aspects, our connections with, with God and our connections with each other, this is where the beauty and, light and meaning in life is to be found. So, after all this, I would say that circumcision is not barbaric, but it's at the core of society, right? With morality, identity, a person with a strong identity is going to have so much more strength in their convictions. We see this in a scary way with like radical Islam. They're so sure about, about who they are that they're so sure about blowing people up. But imagine the opposite. A person so sure about their, their, their necessary to do good in this world. How much they're going to be willing to sacrifice to do what's good and important. I think this idea is captured finally in the last part we said. Just as he enters into the bris, he should enter into Torah, chuppah, and to good deeds. Right? What do you mean just as he enters into the bris? The bris, to enter the bris, requires blood and guts. It's bleeding. It's painful. So I think like, these good things in life, requiring Torah, finding, building a home, and doing good things are going to require blood and guts. And I think that's what Hashem asked of us. And I, hope, I wish to give us all the bracha. It's not that we should all uh, internalize this message and, 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 and succeed and, and connect with Hashem. Now you see why I defer the Devar Torah to my brother-in-law. Okay, we're going to bench now. Uh, the benchers are on this little table.